Mr. Dustin Garrow, how are we, sir? Doing well, Matt. A lot has changed since I think we got together during the WNA, early September, and the we price did. was 60. Hard 60. to believe. Where are we today? <laughs> well, 106-ish. So. 106-ish. Okay, well, there we go. So uh, a lot of things have changed, but some things haven't changed, and we're going to kind of yes. get get through all of that. I, th I think there's... Uh, we are having a sort of Gordon Gecko moment in the sense that I think a lot of people are getting greedy, greedy, greedy for uh, profits on their shares, uh, greedy for um, the kind of term contracts that they're going to be able uh, to, to sign and, and greedy because they want to see more coming down the line because it, it feels like this is going to be a, a long, a long run that we're about to get into. But first of all, I, the thing we got, we are going to talk about, you just mentioned it, that movement in price um, over the last 12 months has been extraordinary, hasn't it? Well, yeah, we went from below 50 now to, you know, 100, 106. I mean, in last year, and, and really, it, yeah, I think December was an interesting month because the price went up $10, 81 to 91, over 2 million pounds of transactions. So kind of that to me says uh, potentially severely restricted near-term supply. Little pockets of it here and there, but I think as a broad base, um, UX was right when they came out and talked about the excess inventory is over. So it's it's, it's over. And and I think there's, there's a couple of parts to the next section, which is the production. We need to, you know, back in the, back in the last cycle, people talk about pounds on the ground. I got lots of pounds on the ground and that's going to drive the value of my company. Pounds on the ground now is going to do nothing for this industry. We need to produce and produce a, a lot of it. So let's start with the, with the big boys. We've seen Kazatomprom and even Cameco talking about the the how hard it is to actually maybe hit some of the targets, which they've indicated previously. So what's happening out there? Yeah, uh, quickly on Cameco, I think clearly they're moving ahead with MacArthur. The startup is slower, not surprising. Uh, and they're they're citing things such as supply chain, uh, personnel training, things like that. The rumors are they may show a little bit uh, more uh, requirement for uranium when they talk early February. Now, do they borrow more? Do they buy more? So again, that's something that uh, needs to be kept in mind. And also, they're now talking Rabbit Lake as uh, as a, the next incremental source. Project's been shut down for more than 10 years. And there's not a lot of pounds there, you know, somewhere high thirties, they say, probably would find more if they looked. But you know, how long does it take to kind of go in, get that dusted off and, you know, how do we move forward? So, so really what we're looking at is kind of between now and the end of the decade. You know, the, the market is saying, um, where's the primary production? And, and we've got the restarts. We may come back to them. They're, they are moving ahead, but it's still not nearly enough uranium. So, and on the Kazakh side, you know, a lot of rumors have been floating around. And they, you know, mention things like uh, asset availability. You know, their asset plant, I'm hearing, maybe second half of 26. Um, you know, putting in well fields. I understand they may have enough drill rigs, maybe not enough personnel. Uh, transport, I know they're saying that they're beginning to use the Trans-Caspian route. I was told by someone who's very knowledgeable that when they shipped through St. Petersburg to North America, it was $5 a pound, give or take. It's now 20 So you, can, you have to look beyond just the production cost side. Uh, the other thing that's really starting to float to the surface is we, you know, we want to increase to 80, let's pick 80 million pounds from the mid, the low to mid fifties. Um, I'm being told all those pounds are committed already. The big project, and I think it's Budin Nova Skoya, uh, that's all Russian. Whatever comes out of that's going to Russia. And I was told everything else has been committed to China already. So there is a school of thought that says if they don't uh, increase production, then they have more problems. And in fact, someone the other day said they think they may be slightly overcommitted 
at that higher production rate. So let's just say the Kazakh situation is not not clear cut, um, risky, and a lot of pressure from the Russians and the Chinese, which I think we can get into. So that's well, the I big did. guys. Those are the established BHP. You hear anything about Olympic Dam or something? No, they're not doing anything. One of the factors that really hurt this industry on the production side is the uh, exit of Rio Tinto. Big mining company. They had Ranger. They had Rossing. And for them to exit the industry was just another kind of, uh, you know, mark on the page of the difficulty of increasing production. Yeah, there's, there's stuff out there, and, and, and I'm going to come back to a couple of things you said. So let, let's stick with the big boys. Okay, uh, I think Cameco experiencing the difficulties of mining, um, and that's kind of potentially going to slow them down and maybe miss a, few, miss a, miss a deadline or, or, or production um, targets. But, you know, that's life. Cause that's some problem. It does kind of feel a little bit, and I don't want to get all conspiratorial, but, you know, we were talking about access to asset and ports and, you know, you talk about the you know price, five bucks to 20 bucks. It's, it's, it's kind of extraordinary, but it kind of feels a little bit like pick your team. Because don't forget, in the background, you've got the U.S. Um, Senate going to vote on um, basically stopping Russian production coming and being used in in the U.S. Now Putin's not going to sit around presumably and go take that on the chin. He maybe he's going to go on the front foot rather than wait around for that. I guess inevitability. So Chinese Russia pressure on Kazakh, Kaz, Kazakhstan as a whole and Kazakhstan from specifically here, that's going to shake up the supply routes. I it's all heading east. What do we in the West do? Because you, you're talking about. The big guys borrowing off of each other. That's they've got to, you know, pay that back at some point. You've to, you, and the bit I want to get onto is some of these greenfields uh, projects. The you know the African plays, some of the U.S. plays. Um, let's let's talk about how they're going to be able to contribute and if they're going to be able to contribute, and how how long before they can contribute. So Africa, we've I, I'm looking at Global Atomic. I'm looking at Bannerman. I'm looking at Lotus. Um, Paladin, but potentially within a, within a reasonable time frame. So, what are the what are the what are the pressures on the market if those guys don't deliver on time? Well, I think you know, talking Najir, um, there's a lot of opinions on what's going to happen there. Uh, obviously, Goviax uh, just put out an announcement that they remain very positive that they can move forward and get funding. Uh, Global Atomic announced the finalization of their third contract, uh, which I thought was interesting. They said that that now fulfills their pre-sale commitment for funding for the project. But they've got to look at the processing side. They've still got the issue of the the new government. Uh, some people are talking that Irano will now look at Emirera, which is a 11 million pound a year ISR project, um, that looks highly unlikely. Uh, the sense on the French side is uh, they might be done in this year. They don't want to announce that. But, you know, they're down to three million pounds. You know, the other uh, production goes to the Nigerian government out of the one existing mine. It's just not worth putting the time and effort in anymore. And, you know, the Russians... They're coming in with uh, military aid, with with military uh, for security. I'm still convinced with what their situation looks like. They're going to be very interested in moving in on the Najir uranium industry, whatever it looks like. Uh, does it mean they don't let global operate? Don't again a lot of moving parts, but I think that you know it would be a very courageous buyer to go in and say, well, I'll do a big contract with a, a, pro, a producer in Najir. So I think it's going to be there. But then again, where does that material go? Does it come into the West to satisfy Western utilities? Mm, probably not so much. Now, Namibia, again, uh, as you know, I do work with Deep Yellow. Tumas is looking very good for production. Could be late twenty six. 
I mean, the mining license is issued, uh, you know, a number of things are going on, but I'll leave that up to the public information. Uh, I know Bannerman, uh, you know, they've uh, stated that they're planning to move forward with a tango. Um, but again, we're looking at a, oh, and the other is Husab. Husab could do better. Well, anything that comes out of Husab is going to China. They're not going to sell it to a Western utility because the Chinese are um, in, in the market for more material too, which we can get to. So Namibia looks good. You know, but there aren't that many producers that are looking um, to produce or, or can open mines, say, pre-2030. So in that time frame, yeah, Deep Yellow 3.6, and then a Tango could add something there. So, yeah, would it help the Western supply story? Yes, but then you look around and you go, where else in Africa, you know, uh, Mauritania, I guess, or whatever it is, I that's could happen, but I, you know, don't see the guys around much. The project is in a risky part of the country. Technically, it may be good, but geopolitical concerns are still there. So, but other than that, and then you've got, you know, Tanzania, you know, will the Russians develop that? Well, if they do, it's Russian. Same with Namibia. They talk about developing the WINGS ISR project. If they do, that's all going into Russia. So it's not going to be delivered to Converdine. Let's put it well, that, that way. That's <laughs> this is where I'm hoping this conversation will go, because if you're talking about niche sharing, you're talking about Russia and France, uh, France stepping away. You're talking um, in Namibia, you know, obviously clearly kind of big Chinese influence. Um, and, and as what people like Deep Yellow, uh, Bannermans of this world, you know, just decide to decide to do or incentivize to do that. Um, you know, China, basically a lot of this stuff is heading east. And if it does head east, what are the options available to the U.S. market? It gets a little bit fraught and a little bit frisky because <laughs> I'm not hearing a lot of talk around big projects in the US. You said maybe, maybe, oh. if everything goes to plan, 18 million pounds. What, what's going to happen at that point? People people get a little bit aggressive if they, if they don't get what they want. So it's going to get tough for the, in the North American market, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think, first of all, the, the North American uranium production side obviously is looking better than it did. Um, the U.S. utilities, I think, uh, based on meetings I had in Charlotte in October, um, are favoring U.S. production as, a, as an adder to their portfolio. But, you know, Encore, I think, is doing well with Rosita and, and Alta Mesa. I see Uranium Energy is a, announced. Willow Creek, they plan to bring into production. Uh, Energy Fuels is probably going to be producing some through the mill, but that mill will be used for other minerals. Um, so yeah, you're, you know, will production begin to increase, but it's going to be eight, 10 million pounds, maybe a lot of smaller ISR. You know, nobody's going to open up a big open pit mine in New Mexico or one in the Powder River Basin or something like that. Uh, we have a lot of guys out on the Colorado Plateau that are very optimistic with their uranium and vanadium deposits. Well, until there's enough milling capacity uh, and you can't all rely on White Mesa, then it doesn't do you any good. Now, one thing I'm looking at Anfield, I think with Shooter and Canyon, as the price has gone up, I think they may have a chance with their hub and spoke bringing in some, but again, the mill's small, you know, 750 tons originally. So, yeah, there's pockets of U.S. production, but is it going to produce 20 million pounds here? No, you know, and nobody's proposing that. So, again, you start to try to have to cobble together these smaller sources, not to say they won't come on, not to say they won't be economic. They should be. Uh, Canada, yes, you know, we've got next gen. You know, is it going to be 28, 30, 32, 
you know, not crystal clear. And even if it does, senior management has said, you need more of these in order to meet the demand. And the other is Denison. I understand that the uh, ISR technical review has gone well. And so could they come in that pre-2030 time frame? Uh, I'm not aware of them in the market yet. And, and the other is the utilities. I mean, we're now two years into the bifurcation of the market. And I continue to hear not just from the uranium side, but particularly conversion. There's just nothing going on that's going to lead to an expansion. You know, just quickly on the conversion side, Converdine have been very public as a non-public company. They are sold out till 29. The next five years, totally sold out. And they've had utilities come to them saying, hey, can't you put a little bit together for me? And the answer is no. The rumors are Cameco and Arano. They're pretty well committed through 27. So we've got, we were always aware of kind of that bottleneck, but now the focus is more on the uranium side. And, you know, Matt, I've been around a very long time on the uranium production area and the low prices starting in the 90s, we had the HEU down blend. Keep in mind that was 400 million pounds sold at a very competitive price, the down blended material. There was another four to 500 million of U308 that was in inventory that was sold. So, you know, the ongoing low prices basically eviscerated the Western uranium production sector. That's why it went from, you know, if you really look at production, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it went up to 162 and all over. The non-Kazakh portion has never been 100, over 100 million pounds. And most times it's well below that, even when the price went to 135. So there's no excess capacity. There's really no milling capability. And you're taking an industry that under investment would be, you know, a, a misnomer. There was just no capital available, not for a short period decades. And so now the industry has to respond after decades of no investment. So that's going to take a while. I've heard maybe a decade. It can You can build enough here and there, Africa, Athabasca, you know, wherever, to where you can begin to have serious primary production increase. Prior to that, you, I guess you consume, consume inventories, you change your fuel cycles, you do whatever you can to keep your plants in operation or not cutting back. So I, I think you, you make a lot of good points there, and I'm trying to remember, <laughs> I'll <still> remember <laughs> some of them, um, because I, I, I think you're right. I, unless this sector kind of gets itself sort of out, you know, you're going to have nuclear phased out or designed out of of some of the, these solutions um, at the moment. Do you know what I mean? If, if it's not working efficiently, then people will find a way around it. So I think that's the kind of big overarching thought that the industry needs to have. So to your point, US market, what scares me the most is, is kind of, it's fragmented. It's lots of small stuff that needs to be put together. And that usually suggests hugely in inefficient um, processes and, that, and, and therefore, you know, costly. The other thing is, it's totally reliant on a public market uh, to solve this problem. Public market companies have different drivers and incentives. That's the thing that scares me the most, right? So some of these headlines are about what it would cost to, let's say a shoe drink, what it was going to cost to, well, one, it's, it's small, as you said, but two, what's it going to cost to actually ramp that up? Maybe they can find the money for that. But explain how. I'm not, I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying explain how. Even energy fuels, you've got this massive plant, well, When's it coming online? How's that coming through? We, I think Mark's talked on the show about buying ore, owning that ore, processing that ore, and taking the upside. So some of the companies talking about using what they say, you need, we need to understand, well, what does that do to your economics? You're not capturing all of the upside there. Someone else is buying this ore off of you at a price which suits that. 50-50 was a number of those that was suggested. And 
So gen- generally, kind of, and you name a few other th- you know, things, we need clearing. Like Denison, great. You, you've run some tests. They're all really good. It wasn't for a very long time. We're talking d- d- days, a handful of days, not for a long period of time on what is quite a technical stage. So show us, talk to us, tell us why that's going to work. Because otherwise, and this applies to all of the companies in the sector, and I say public companies incentivize in very, very different ways about driving share price, not necessarily in terms of the current management about getting into production. And that scares me because there's a massive need. We haven't talked about the demand side of this equation yet. On the supply side, you're talking about people giving dates and times, which I'm not sure they believe, but they've got to talk about because that drives the share price. That means this timeline goes out and out and out. This gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger as demand comes. And we haven't even talked about the demand coming because no one's really put numbers on it from SMRs. Right, so it's it looks like a horrific movie where <laughs> everything's just gonna go wrong, yeah. and people are sort of you know flopping around, you know, talking about getting greedy as we said at the beginning about what price they could possibly get from their contracts. So it needs to come together, so I, but it won't because there's too many leaders, and I think it's going to be a little bit messier than we thought. What that's going to do, I suspect, to you know. Investors is going to be delightful, but for the sector as a whole, it's going to be not not pretty. Don't know if you yeah, I think agree. we're looking at uh, you know, and I've told the Deep Yellow Board that uh, this is a di- totally different market than we've experienced in the past. And just to quickly go back for a minute, it was that excess inventory, you know, the overproduction even before the commercial nuclear sector started up. I heard a number of two and a half billion pounds were produced before reactors started to be built. But keep in mind the crossover, which was a great deal way before your time, was 1990. Then production fell below consumption, so we started to eat into that inventory. Might have been in natural UF6, might have been in HEU. However, that was eventually liberated. Well, now we're at the point where that inventory is not available, and we could spend quite a bit of time on it, but it's also impacting things like location exchanges. You know, in the old days, if you had pounds of Cameco, you wanted them in Converdine, you found someone, did a paper deal, you never moved the pounds. Now, you can't do location exchanges because that inventory is so limited. So that's kind of one thing that's beginning to really impact the market. Uh, the other thing, and you know, we could spend time on is personnel. I had a, a conference call the other day and someone mentioned that based on their reckoning, more than 80% of the new green fields projects are proposed by management groups that have never produced a pound of uranium. So when we talk about, you know, will Denison, you know, will that ISR and the Athabasca work, uh, there's risk. There's risk attached to next gen, you know, again, a different kind of deposit. Um, So it's the industry is not without production risk. So you say, well, does that delay things? It could. Now, What I'm hearing in some investor calls is there is pretty significant interest. I think if you're a U.S.-based producer, you can show some, you know, competency to do what you're doing. Uh, You'll probably be able to raise the capital. Um, The big projects are starting to be a billion dollars plus. Probably be a lot of questions during due diligence. And, you know, part of it is contracts. I mean, I go back to the WNFM World Nuclear Fuel Market Meeting in Montreal, June of 2022, the invasion was still fresh. And I believe it was Cameco senior management looked at the audience full of fuel managers and said, this future depends on you. In other words, we're not gonna build things hoping you show up you will make commitments, then we will consider going forward. Well, and as you point out, in the uranium side, there's been minimal. Now, Europe has done a lot of contracting. 
So I think they have a different view, different set of circumstances, different pressures, factors, you know, security of supply, you name it, mostly nation level, government level. The U.S., again, has been um, modest in its contracting. But I think the, the utilities are now starting to get the sense that there aren't a lot of options out there and they better start looking seriously. But what do they see? Uh, there's not a lot of even, you know, the restarts. I'm contending we're kind of at the end of the restart phase of the market. You know, be it Encore Energy Fuels, you know, Paladin, name it. Lotus hasn't done any contracting and Boss has just done the one contract. But in general, we're kind of through that group that didn't need to raise a bunch of capital. They were, you know, refreshing existing facilities. But we're kind of coming to the end of that, which we'd always anticipated would be there. Now it's those Greenfields project. And I can tell you, $68, no. I don't know who's offering that, but they should perhaps re-examine their contracting strategy. But I think you're going to see a pretty major move up in the term price. You make you make a good point. We, we, I'm going to I'm going to stop it there because this is one of the most important things that I've been seeing when I'm looking at all of this commentary in the market by a very excitable uh, investors. Is spot price is not term contracting price. Term is is lagging behind and needs to play needs to play cash up. So if you're doing the math on your company's margins because they've told you what that ASIC is going to be. Um, one, I believe the ASIC number, uh, and because and because things go wrong and because maybe, again, incentivized to give nothing but good news. But two, that's not the price the companies are going to get. Contract price is lagging at the moment. Where where do you think it needs to be? Where, where do you think it should be? 68, I agree with you, is kind of not, probably not reflective of where it should be, but what is it? It's not 106, clearly, or 130, maybe, um, although not feasible that it could be, um, is where do you think it is today? And in terms of the psychology of the sellers, because it's our seller's market, what do you think they're going to be asking for? Well, I think before the run-up, which you know wasn't very long ago, and you and I talked about it, there were, I think, a, a pretty good tranche between 70 and 80, I've been told that there were those producers that said, yeah, it's 75 escalated. I can get back my capital. I can cover my costs, make a little bit of a margin, will get me moving forward, you know, whatever. Um, and I know a, a pretty good portion of the utilities dug in their heels. Okay. And they said, well, wait a minute. You know, is that a real, do you really need that? And and you and I have talked. One of the problems is, is when you publish an all-in sustaining cost number, you better be careful on how you define that because the fuel managers will go, well, wait a minute, that number's 40 and you want 75? You know, you really are trying to gouge me here. Well, all-in sustaining costs doesn't include all the costs. It's not... So there, there's been a little bit of that. But I did look at what have the utilities been actually paying. And it's interesting. In the post-Fukushima era, starting in 11 through 22, the U.S. utilities averaged $43 a pound. And since 2018, they've averaged, I think it's $37 a pound. So you're now going in saying, Mr. Utility, I don't want you to just pay more. I want you to double what you've been paying. So I think that's something that's uh, difficult for them to digest, to kind of say, I'm still getting Russian deliveries. Those could get you know, interrupted. They haven't. I've still got legacy contracts. I mean, Cameco, if you look at their price sensitivity table, in 25, if the spot's 140, Unless I'm wrong, they get 66. So not faulting their contracting strategy, I think that reflects what they did for MacArthur River startup. And they, they'll make money. They're not going to go out of business at that level. 
But I think that's what the, the suppliers are wrestling with is not most, a number of them can make it economically, but what am I leaving on the table, quote unquote? Because the utilities, they're not paying that 106 today. I mean, if some of them are unfortunate enough, they have to buy on the spot and they pay that. It doesn't come up in fuel costs for years. It sits in inventory, then it's processed, then it goes in the reactor. And when it's burned is when they collect the dollars. So it could be five years from now, but they have to look that far forward. You know, I've been asked, well, wait a minute, it's 106. What about demand destruction? You know, what price do they shut down those reactors? I think it's going to be more availability will affect reactor operations then 150, 175 I saw the other day, 200. You've got a multi-billion dollar machine out there and you really got to operate it. So, you know, that, that I don't see the demand destruction. Now we, we'll get to SMRs, for example, but I'll leave that up to you. So, Well, we, no, we, I do want to talk about it. It's on the list. Um, but <laughs> you, you, you make a really interesting point. I don't think we've talked about it before in terms of, the commitment to buy pounds at a, at a certain price, the actual dollars you say don't transact for how long? What's that, what's that well, process? Well, you know, with? okay, because, okay. It, we're me, just kind of, using the spot. Like, yeah, because it kind of feels like, it feels like dating to me, right? It's gone from, you know, buyer's market, seller's market, and, you know, you you, you kind of like the utility bars. Yeah, I'm looking at all of you utility bars watching this, is, you know, it used to be the the, the bell of the bull. Everyone wanted yeah. to, you know, go and have a dance with you. <laughs> but of, of late, it's kind of heading the way is like, um, perhaps you're a bit too old to be wearing that dress and your negotiation powers are on the wane here. But you, you, that's what it kind of felt like to me. It's like, you know, we're moving to a seller's market and I'm not buying what you're dressed in at the moment. But if you were saying that, the consensual part of that relationship is actually not consummated for a period of time. But what what are the what's that commitment look like in terms of it's you know that is the number you committed to so you must pay that at some point down the line. What does that process look like? Let's talk spot purchases. Okay, so somebody yep. comes in the market today, they have to agree to one hundred and six dollars. They buy a hundred thousand pounds utility X. They take delivery in June. Well, if they look across their fuel portfolio and they go, ooh, that's by far and away my highest cost tranche. I'm going to sit it in inventory for a while because I've got deliveries from Cameco and Kazad and Fram and everybody much lower. I'm paying 55 for that. Okay, so then that goes into, they do conversion, enrichment, fabrication, it eventually goes into the reactor. Um, how far out is that? Pick two years. Some of the pounds then sit in the reactor and are burned for two, three years. So you actually, that's when they charge for those pounds of uranium, the conversion, and all of that. So it's pushed out probably no less than four years. And it could be five or six. It's like, well, everything else will get more expensive, so I'll hide that $106, 100,000 pounds. It isn't at the end of the year, the accountants don't go, oh, 106, you know, you paid it this, so therefore it's a hit on your fuel cost. The fuel cost is calculated as the fuel is consumed, and that is years in the future. So the fuel costs are gonna stay probably pretty good, but they're going, oh, buddy, out, you know, four or five years from now, it could look pretty, pretty bleak. So, so yeah, you've got to look at how do they account for the the fuel. So it's not right. like a trader that buys it in three months has put the dollars out. That's a little different. That's a direct hit. So one of the, one of the things I'm sort of str struggling with here is what happens if demand is not met? Because we've talked about SMR. And, you know, maybe settling on a technology, Chinese, Russian, Rolls Royce in the UK, whatever, you know, uh, whatever the US comes up with. And that will be interesting because once that kind of firms up, that demand should 
drive. I've not seen data anywhere which sort of gives an indication of what that's going to do to additional demand requirements on top of the existing, you know, big, big reactors. I mean, are, are you one of, is that a kind of conversation that you've been party to and, you know, are people concerned about this or because if not, it comes back to something I said right at the beginning, which was if we're not careful, nuclear is the solution and gets designed out. Something, you, they spend a lot more money and that's a long way away, but hydrogen comes to the fore. Other forms of money, yeah, m money is thrown at other solutions. I mean, what, what, what do we do? Well, I think, uh, you know, looking a bit at the market dynamics, the, for example, the Westinghouse chemical arrangement, I think as Westinghouse signs agreements for new big reactors, for SMRs, they will be looking to Cameco to fuel those plants. So does that then somehow reduce their involvement in let's call it the third party market? Will they be going out selling to, you know, Wolf Creek Nuclear with one reactor? You know, so we could see a shift in who gets the material from a business combination standpoint. We've got the French, there's Arano, uh, obviously the Chinese are, are planning to provide fuel for any reactors they sell or build. I don't think the Chinese are gonna build a reactor and not have the fuel. That's why they're in the market right now, I think looking for more and more material. So we could kind of see that shift. SMR demand, the WNA, if you look at the uh, forecasts, have started to kind of layer that in uh, a ways out. Um, we know Darlington came into the market for fuel starting in 28. Now, I, don't, I didn't see the request. Um, and I think some of the other SMR vendors are, I mean, you know, Rolls-Royce must be looking at the market. And I don't know if you noticed it, but there was some Senate subcommittee testimony a month or so ago, and it was uh, Dow Chemical, their VP Energy. They're planning to build four, a four pack of micro reactors at one of their big chemical plants. I believe it's in Texas. And uh, he said, if they can't convince us that there is sufficient uranium to, to fuel those reactors for an extended period, because they want to start building in like 26. And uh, he said, we will not do the project. You know, that's supposedly why the, the project up here in Kemmerer, Wyoming was going to be 2030. Now it's 2032 because of the fuel situation. So, you know, I think that there could be that strange market dynamic for who goes out. That's why I think we have these uh, big consuming countries now out, China. They've got a delegation. They were in Australia. They were just in Brazil looking to invest in production. Um, the Japanese, they have two of the trading companies, and one of them has just initiated that process on behalf of the Japanese utilities, not just can we sign a contract, can we invest in production for security of supply? And we expect to see the South Koreans, we expect to see the Indians, and both the Emirates and the Saudis. So that's another factor, and they're going, hey, we're not going to rely on the commercial market for all of our pounds. We want to own that production. So the, another factor. So will that then shift who gets, you know, do you want to be the guy that goes, I'm not doing that. I'm not signing, con you know, there was a one U.S. utility in Charlotte that said, I don't see the need to pay over $60. So I'm not going to play in this market. Okay, well, that is a pretty significant risk. Maybe the right decision. He may look good as can be, my guess is he'll be out paying a lot more than that. So, so, so we'll just have, you know, you, this question comes up a lot. How do we expect the Western supply sector to address this demand, even if it doesn't go up much? 
you know, even if we kind of stay at that old 1% a year, you still have availability issues, shortage. I mean, I'll use the S word. We could have uranium short. So then the skeptic would say, well, then the technology's a goner. You know, we'll build more windmills and all that. I think the pressure on the price is going to be significant because I'm going to go, if I need it, what do you pay, pay if you need it? What's it worth? You know, that, that's the question. It won't be necessarily the sellers being greedy. It's going to be the buyers going, what does it take to get that pound? And I think we're quickly moving toward that kind of a market. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's interesting times. So I think it's going to be lots of speculation. We've seen lots of numbers bounce around yeah. about where, where it gets to this year, how sustained that, mm -hmm. that peak will be. Um, all speculation, a lot of yeah. hype. Uh, but I think the reality is now it's a say supplies market. Uh, can they? And when do they? Certainly, in terms of the greenfield, the near term or the advanced developers who are near term potentially producers. Um, when do they make the move? You know, what do those contracts look like? What what comfort does that give the 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 the, the banks? At the, at the moment about the sector because I think the narrative changed. It feels like it should be an easy transaction, but um, we yet to see any conversations about it, um, any moves about it. And, and, and that kind of is the surprising bit for me because from a sector which has been keen to put out press releases about <laughs> anything yeah. and usually insignificant things, um, this very important juncture is surely about saying, Here's how we get into production. Here's how we finance the build. And here's the cost of that capital to us. Um, so I look forward to seeing a lot more of that that conversation and, uh, and of that nature this this year from the very oh. few, the hands full you could. Well, I think what's happened is, you know, when the market changes this quickly, everybody steps back and they say, well, is this it? Should we jump in now, get contracts, a sure. number, 80? Well, what if in three months it's no, it's not sixty-eight. The term price is one hundred and twenty. I mean, I don't know. That's the point. Is this market, to my mind, is unpredictable on the upside? It's unpredictable, it, which is really good because it's not the lithium market, right? The lithium yeah. market set quite a bad example over the last eighteen months, and again, you know, three, four years ago, where it was is a nascent sector and very small sector, kind of, kind of a bit uranium-ish. And it's in its pro in uranium's profile of you know before the last six months. Yeah. Um, and you know, investors new to mining, uh, new to investing in mining, and maybe new to uranium, won't necessarily appreciate that. I think there's only an upside here because we're we're running out of this stuff. That's the difference. And by the way, we're not going to be very good at actually producing it when we said we we're going to. So, I I think it will be a very strong year. Um. And I think the banks understand that, and institutions understand it, politicians understand it. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about where this goes. The bit that's going to intrigue me, you know, I hope it, 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 uh, it happens, is how long does this run for? That's the exciting bit here. Well, I, I agree with the UX comment that we're in the early days of the term contracting cycle. Yeah, there was 160 million pounds put under contract last year in the term market. I'm not impressed with that. Show me 250. You know, it's got to be more than the famous run rate uh, replacement. And we're not seeing that. We're not seeing the commitment. So again, the supply sector is saying, okay, um, you know, I don't have a reactor out there that needs this stuff. I've got a hole that I think I'm going to put in the ground. I can wait. So, you know, you guys, I mean, again, this is, it, it's it's a fact of life in any market, but I've never seen it like this in nuclear fuel. You, the consumer, you will tell us if you want us to do this. For us to do this, it looks like this. So, yes or no? I mean, if, if no, then I'll go and, you know, do AI. I don't know. I don't care. So again, we don't have the big mining companies that are committed, you know, Rio Tinto, they had a board member who was Mr. Uranium. 
back in the old days, Ronnie Walker. You don't see that now. What, BHP? Eh, so what? This is a, a byproduct that we don't like. They haven't liked it ever since they got into Olympic Dam. So are they going to come in and say, oh, yeah, you know, remember those projects, Ulyri and Kintyre, we sold because we didn't like the commodity? Uh, you know, it's just isn't is you know it isn't there so you got a bunch of smaller guys that go yeah i'd like to get in the business but you know and i'll not, learn another job it'll be fine it, it's, yeah. um, <laughs> not to worry so anyway not to worry well like until the next time I, I won't worry then until the next time i suspect we'll be talking about even more good news um as ever thank you so much for your insight i learned a couple of really cool things in that so i do appreciate that um and uh almost and upwards See you soon. Absolutely. Let's not wait four months to talk again.